Then you get some really interesting but unknown characters within Black British history. I came across a gentleman called Pablo Fanky, who owned a circus in 19th century Britain. There has to be a film in there somewhere. A black man running a circus, a successful circus by all accounts, in 19th century Britain. Then you have people like Samuel Coleridge Taylor, who is a well-known classical composer and the youngest member of the Pan-African Conference. It's important to remember the first Pan-African Conference in the world occurred right here in London. Not in Nigeria, not in Ghana, not in Jamaica, not in America, but the very idea that would undermine empire itself came together right here in the center of empire itself. And people like Samuel Coleridge Taylor uh, were involved in that process. So, you know, these are some significant figures and some of black British history prior to 1948 and what I call uh, the Windrush mythology in domestic brain itself. But then you've got to factor in rebellions in Jamaica, the Baptist War. Uh, you've got a factor in Paul Bogle, you've got a factor in everything that's going on throughout the British Empire. People like Kwame Nkrumah prior to in in independence, etc. Um, so the entire history of the British Empire is British history. And conceptually, when people think of the British working class, they think just of people in Britain and they deliberately forget or distort that Britain had a multi-ethnic globe span in labour force up until the 1960s, yeah? up until yesterday morning, so to speak. So that history is all British history. At the end of World War II, given the racial reforms that happened in World War II, given the change in nature of where the world's going, given the undermining of the very idea of race itself, to a point, I don't want to over-romanticize it, but lots of those effects of World War II, the need for labor here, etc., 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 we see now the Windrush. For those who may not be familiar, the Windrush was a boat that came to Britain from the Caribbean, landing at Tilbury Docks on the 22nd of June, 1948, bringing Caribbean migrants to England. It was not the first boat to bring post-war Caribbean migrants to the UK, but the entire generation of Caribbeans that came to Britain between 1948 and 1962 have been subsequently labeled the Windrush generation. Today, the Windrush generation is very romanticized. You know, even though, even in the height of the Windrush scandal, you know, people think of the Windrush scandal, but people also think of these sort of you know, plucky Caribbeans who came and you know, faced the toughness of, of British life with dignity. In a way, our grandparents are romanticised now that you know they're old. Many of them are passing away, but that is not how they were received at the time. In fact, the British government that received the Windrush, Clement Attlee's government, referred to the people on board the Windrush as an incursion and said that steps needed to be taken so that further influxes were not encouraged. Yeah. So from the very beginning of post-war Caribbean migration, black and brown immigrants were considered problematic, not based on their action, not based on their behavior, not based on their merit, not based on whether or not they were paying for themselves or not, but based simply on the, on the color of their skin. And the government was very conscious of that. Wonderful book looking at this trio of books about immigration, sort of the most important of which being a book called Whitewashing Britain by Kathleen Paul, but also The Battle of Britishness by Tony Kushner, and An Immigration History of Britain by Panayokos Panayi. Yeah? So looking at some of those books, you really see the context in which our grandparents came into this country. But nonetheless, even in the face of institutionalized racism, even coming from countries with poverty and problems and whatever else, the history of black people in Britain fundamentally transformed the British popular culture. You think of something like Notting Hill Carnival that we just now take for granted. The largest street festival in the world outside of the Americas that emerges in a context of West London radicalism with people like Claudia Jones um, and the whole political movement that's occurring in Lambert Grove in the wake of the murder of Kelso Cole Crane. Kelso Cole Crane was a Trinidadian man that was murdered in 1958 in a racist attack in, in Lambert Grove, Notting Hill sort of area. And the first incarnation of a sort of public festival occurs in the wake of that, but it's actually in King's Cross. And then one occurs in West London in 1966 and eventually becomes the Hill Carnival, led by a man called Russ Henderson, also Trinidadian. And Russ Henderson uh, is a Trinidadian, Calypsonian and classical pianist. And originally this festival was just a festival. Russ Henderson comes out of his Trinidadian steel pan, it becomes a Caribbean festival, it becomes a Trinidadian festival until us Jamaicans came along in the 70s and hijacked it with our sound systems and it becomes a fusion festival of Jamaican and Trinidadian culture. But if you think just about Notting Hill Carnival and the you know, 100 million, 200 million, somewhere in that region that it brings into Kensington and Chelsea every year, you start to see not just the cultural contribution but the economic contribution of black migrants to Britain. You look at the English football team and the way it's changed since I was a child and you start to see this history of 
the way in which black British achievement is just seen as achievement and the negatives are seen as black. So gang violence, crime, problems that black communities share with all other communities are marketed in a particular way, but achievements are sort of seen as separate. And so it's always important to keep the consciousness of the positive contributions of black migrants to this country and also not forget some of the history of how we got here. Today for people who are a lot younger than myself, they grew up in a world that's relatively multi-ethnic and relatively multicultural and it's easy to forget if they even know in the first place some of the battles of the 80s, the Broadwater Farm riots, the Brixton riots, uh, the New Cross fire, some of these really significant but you know really sad and tumultuous events that led us to a place where there was racial reform to an extent where there's still massive challenges to face but this history of the relationship between racialized white power and black migrants here in Britain that is a relationship that isn't going anywhere however much we comfort ourselves with liberal platitudes it's still something that a conflict which exists and will continue to exist and being conscious of the history of it is better than being ignorant of the history of it.